So, welcome back students. So, in the previous module that is module 4, we have seen the heterogeneous catalysis and we have seen various reactions, the gas uh, liquid reaction, gas solid reactions, discussed about the reactors and various flow sheets. So, continuing with that, we move on to the homogeneous catalysis. So, homogeneous catalysis in this particular module, primarily we are targeting the transition metal catalyst. So, the current module starts with homogeneous catalysis and this lecture will actually first define the homogeneous catalysis and compare it with heterogeneous catalysis and then we will look some flow sheets. So, we have seen the homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis, we will see some difference, the homogeneous you already know homogeneous we will see difference and primarily uh, this homogeneous catalysis as the name suggests in module name, it is used for bulk chemical manufacturing. So, other than bulk chemical manufacturing, we also will take some examples from fine chemical also. There are some application concerning fine chemical, we will see later on, pre but initially we will see the bulk chemicals. And uh, to sum it up, at the end we will discuss the acetic acid production. So, the acetic acid production, we will not go into the flow sheets because there are variants of flow sheets. We will first discuss what are the methods by which acetic acid is made. Then we will go on and discuss the reaction mechanism and finally, we get hold of the process parameters. So, the homogeneous catalysis occurs in virtually every area of the chemical process industry. So, as the name suggests homogeneous, it means single phase. So, the single phase primarily we are referring to liquid phase because gas phase whenever we refer gas or solid, the catalyst is in the solid phase. So, that is concerned to heterogeneous. So, gas means we are considering when we consider liquid phase only this homogeneous phase. So, where are these used? They are primarily used for various polymerization production, polymer production, the polymerization processes. Then they are also used synthesis of bulk chemicals, just now I have discussed primarily we will be taking up this particular module for the production of bulk chemicals such as various solvents, detergents and plasticizers. So, detergents are very important, one is the linear alkylated benzene sulfonated, LAB they call it, linear alkyl benzyl sulfonated based, these are the compounds, detergents, then plasticizers, so plasticizers are made so as to improve the polymer quality and uh, they are additives basically plasticizer and then various solvents like uh, uh, alcohols or acetic acid or methanol, we will see those examples later. Then fine chemicals as I told you, we will also take up some examples of fine chemicals later on. So, fine chemicals as I told you, if you recall in the first module, they are having a high market value. So, because the production of a small amount is uh, a lot of revenue is earned. So, that is also important, but anyhow as I told you the economy of the country is defined by the production of this inorganic and organic bulk chemical, so base chemical which we consider. So, what is this common phenomena? Common phenomena is when homogeneous catalysis, the catalyst complex is dissolved in the reaction mixture. Okay. So, you do not have a separate entity or different phase. So, the catalyst is dissolved in the reaction mixture. What is the reaction mixture? Reaction mixture is number of components. Let us say you have three components, four components reacting together, whatever. So, it is dispersed or it is within that particular reaction mixture phase. So, what happens is that if we have a catalyst medium, okay. so let us say you have a metal ligand here and you have a ligand here, ligand here, ligand here, ligand here. So, this entire is a catalyst and this catalyst is same, this particular complex is same for the entire phase. So, it means that every atom of the metal, this is the metal, this is the metal, every atom of the metal is exposed to the reaction mixture. So, what does that mean? It means all the atoms participate of the metal atom in the catalysis B. So, it means you are getting full value out of it, the catalyst area or the catalyst uh, activity, the, F, the maximum activity you are getting out of it. So, but in heterogeneous catalysis, I have written here separately, metal is often placed on a carrier material. So, if you recollect the carrier material means, uh, suppose you have a substrate here and in the carrier material it is loaded here. Let us say in, when we discuss in the monoliths, okay, you, you remember monoliths, there are parallel channels and in that channel this 
is coated, the catalyst is coated on those channels. So, it is placed on a carrier metals or as a porous metal sponge and only the surface atoms are active. So, it means when they are coated only the surface on top this one they are active with the reacting mixture. So, this is the difference. So, one of them is totally all they are exposed to the reaction mixture in the other case heterogeneous only the surface atoms are exposed to the reaction mixture. So, in terms of activity per metal center, so per metal center means if you consider that particular ligand if we ask this. So, suppose this is the ligand. So, in terms of activity per metal center, so metal center means this metal center M, M is the metal center. Homogeneous catalysts are generally significantly more active. So, why are they more active? They are exposed to the entirely to the reaction mixture one is reason that is the reason why there will be a high dispersion of homogeneous catalysis which minimizes the effect of catalyst poisons. Now, when they are dispersed in a medium, so it means if one center is poisoned only that center now is reactivated the others will not be affected. That is what the next point says that one poison molecule deactivates only one metal complex. So, it means only this complex is decomposed. The other one let us say this is another ligand, this ligand are connected to it, they will be ok, but this is decomposed. So, it means that one poison molecules will deactivate one metal complex, but in heterogeneous catalysis the poison molecule can block. Now, in the case of heterogeneous catalysis, if it is poisoned, it may block a active site. If it blocks active sites, it can also block a pore. Let us say you have several active sites and it blocks it some of them let us say 80 percent is blocked. It means it is as good as blocking the entire pore. So, this phenomena is called as pore plugging ok, this is pore plugging. So, it means, but on the other hand this is much more selective because you have only one type of atoms exposed to the reaction mixture. So, it means it is more selective means what? It will only do one sort of reaction, it will not do the other reactions. So, it has only one type of active sites. So, it will do a certain reaction, but in heterogeneous catalyst it has different active sites because the active sites also depend upon the pore width, the porosity all those things come to the play. So, it means in heterogeneous catalyst since there are different active sites it may lead to undesired site reactions ok. So, it means discrete metal complexes the final point discrete metal complexes in homogeneous systems keeps a well defined catalyst system. So, as usual if this is a well defined uh, structure if it is a well defined structure, it is a well defined structure, distribution of structure is uniform, then its characterization is also easy and that is true. So, it can be easily characterized or analyzed by traditional techniques such as IR, NMR or UV. So, you can easily find out whether the particular reactor mixture has the catalyst particle or not because they are uniform. So, they will have a sharp identification, the fingerprint is very easy to identify. So, if I want to draw it pictorially. So, it is homogeneous is the left hand side, heterogeneous in the right hand side. So, you have a mixture, let us say you have a mixture here. So, here you have a metal complex, just now I drew this. So, this is the metal center and the ligands surrounded. So, this in homogeneous all are like this. So, you cannot see, you cannot see it is entirely dispersed. So, metal complex are dispersed in liquid, ok. But in this case, if you see, we have made dots, even though I have made a cross section of these dots. This is the cross section of the dots and in these dots there are some channels within that solid catalyst media and in the channels you have the pores and in the pores you have coated catalyst surface. This catalyst surface only this amount of area is actually ex exposed ok. So, suppose this is the reaction bedding coming, so it is only exposed this much area, but in this case you can see it is exposed throughout. So, it is the example of catalyst dispersion in homogeneous and heterogeneous. So, it means in heterogeneous the metal and carrier atoms only outer atoms are active, this is the difference. So, going ahead with the homogeneous catalysis, so it is possible to observe the effect of changes. So, what are the advantages? This is another advantage. So, these are some of the advantages if I say advantage. possible to observe the effect of changes in ligands or reaction conditions because as I just now told you or I repeat. So, since the metal ligand are uniform or they are equally distributed, so it is very easy to observe any change 
suppose I want to change the ligand, then I can just change the ligand and then see the effect. So, it is very easy to observe what is the change if I replace a ligand suppose L with L1 or L2 or L3 and then see what is the effect of catalysis. So, that is, so it means you can check the reaction conditions as well as the type of ligand which is not possible in heterogeneous. So, it is selective for a specific product because modification of the ligand. So, if suppose you modify the ligand L with L1 or L2, L3. So, it will give different compounds. So, based on the selection of L1, L2, L3 and the catalytic medium, so you will get different products. So, that is what you will depending upon the ligand, you will get different products for different atoms. The behavior of heterogeneous catalysis with their complex surface is significantly more difficult to understand because this catalyst media when it is coated on the surface of the pores. So, the factors there are several factors such as if I want to draw this catalyst structure let us say is the interconnected structure. For example, we discussed the zeolite part. So, let us say you have here, here, this, here these are the all catalyst media. So, it means like that if there are many planes across this and this. So, it will based upon various parameters like porosity, then maybe tortuosity, pore size or porosity is the same thing, pore size or volume, all these then pore diameter or anyway this is the same thing pore size and pore diameter. So, these factors are not there in the homogeneous catalyst media. So, to observe any phenomena there are many factors involved. So, hence the modification with respect to reaction condition and the reacting system is very difficult to undertake. And further the homogeneous catalyst is normally carried out in a liquid phase. So, temperature control is rather easy. Why is it easy? Because if you conduct in liquid phase the amount of temperature it will gain, it is will be less because you are surrounded by a solvent media. So, in the solvent media the temperature, uh, you know the dispersion of the temperature is much more easier as compared to in the gas phase. Let us say you have a heterogeneous catalysis where gas and solid is present or gas and liquid is present. So, gas will uh, heat up very fast. So, temperature distribution is not that easy or temperature control is not that easy, but in the case of liquid it is not so, it is can be controlled because it is the heat is, is easily dissipated, but there is a downside to it also. So, the amount of temperature you can take up in homogeneous is also less than because the solvent would not be able to take such high temperatures, it cannot be able to dissipate. So, you do not want, you do not suppose you carry out exothermic reactions. So, they may generate heat. So, if they generate heat, so then it has to be dissipated. So, the liquid may have some limit, let us say the solvent has some boiling point. So, you cannot go beyond that. So, your vapor pressure will be very high. So, your gas phase will form. So, it means that you have a, there a constraint, the, num, the actual temperature in which you can do the reaction. So, that is exactly why this is not suitable for endothermic reactions. The homogeneous in the thermic reactions, these are not suitable because you need the high temperatures. So, these require high temperature. So, high temperature means your solvent phase becomes predominant. So, it, if a temperature required is high, the solvent selection becomes a problematic. This is exactly the opposite in heterogeneous. So, exothermic reactions, endothermic reactions both can be conducted in heterogeneous catalysis, but in homogeneous catalysis because of the constraint of high temperature endothermic reactions are usually, usually not carried out. So, if I just jot it down all the different properties and uh, do a uh, difference between them. So, what is the catalyst form in the case of heterogeneous? It is often solid with the metal and metal oxide, while homogeneous it is a metal oxide primarily. The activity it can be varied based on the pore size, pore diameter, tortuosity, etcetera, but this is very high homogeneous because you know use a single type of active sites. So, it is also variable selectivity because you have different types of active sites. So, different site active site means different reactions while it is highly selective because you can uh, tailor made the ligand and you can decide whether you want a chemo region, stereo region or no. So, different enantiomers you can produce based on the type of ligand you use. So, um, the stability it is stable to high temperature 
because as I told you heterogeneous can go to high temperature, it become it is only low temperature because most of the catalyst decompose in that solvent media because its temperature rises solvent media is also a problematic case so the catalyst also breaks down or decompose. Reaction condition that is why it is, it is able to take very harsh reaction condition but it is able to take only mild homogeneous. Then the sensitivity against poisons, the sensitivity against poisons is very high in the case of heterogeneous because if they clog one of the uh, catalyst surface, so they will cause clogging of the pores. So that is why the poison capacity is higher in case of heterogeneous as compared to homogeneous. So mass transfer it is important because you have different phases. Let us say your products are formed in the gas in the liquid phase and go, it has to go to the gas phase. It has to diffuse from the liquid phase to the interface and then to the gas phase. So there is a mass transfer resistance. So that is why this is very important. But here it is unimportant because the entire reaction is carried in a single phase. So it does not need to diffuse or pass through the phases. Okay. Then mechanistic understanding it is complex because you have several types of ports, several types of carrier materials, supports, pour and this channels how the channels are oriented all this very difficult to get a complex or this the steps or the mechanism. But it is very easy because you know you have a similar type of site and you can easily produce your desired compound. Solvent is not required in the case of heterogeneous but it is required in the case of homogeneous. So it can be also a product also the solvent itself and be a product also as or as a byproduct. Catalyst recycle. Now, this is a very important point which I have not touched now. It is not necessary the catalyst recycling or separation because when your products are formed, it will diffuse from a one phase to other phase and then getting uh, get out from the uh, entire system. So, the catalyst will actually be staying in the let us say in the reactor, it will stay in the solid phase or liquid phase. The gas phase you have the products exiting from the reactor. But it is very difficult in the case of homogeneous phase, the recovery phase, because in this recovery phase you have to use some several solvents which are more, let us say one of the solvent is more soluble with the products and other solvent is more soluble in the solvent phase. Suppose one of the, you have to choose in a separation train basically. So what happens in the separation train? In the separation train is the concept in the homogeneous catalysis. So you choose different solvents. One solvent may be more selective towards the product and another solvent may be more selective towards the catalyst medium. In that way you need more number of steps to do a catalyst separation and recycling. Then if the everything is good about homogeneous, then why are not we using it? Why do we need heterogeneous? If homogeneous you have so many advantages, why do we need it? Yes, the issue is specific catalyst in terms of economics and industrial application is not always required. For example, complex feed because uh, you know when we write equations, we write like this A plus B gives C. Such uh, simple reactions do not occur in nature. For example, in petroleum you know now you have petroleum, you have this feed naphtha feed or you have the alkylate feed, the alkylate you do isomerization let us say. So alkylate may be of different molecular size. So this A may be different A, A1, A2, A3, A4, A6 let us say it is reacting with B. Let us say we are uh, adding hydrogen to it or alkylate means just A1, A2, A3 are forming a different isomers. Okay. So that way you have several of the feeds. So that how will you prepare a homogeneous catalyst? It is very difficult because you have different starting materials, so many different starting materials, it is a complex feed. So that is ex what exactly homogeneous catalyst is not that useful in oil refinery. So it is does not justify a specific catalyst use. Then as I told you in the last slide, the primary challenge is in the separation of catalyst and product. Okay. So catalyst and product separation, you need a distillation train, separation train. But this becomes easy only when only when the reaction products have a low boiling molecular weight relative to the molecular weight of the catalyst. So if the molecular weights are different of the reaction material and the catalyst medium, then you can probably separate out. Otherwise, if they are close to each other, the difference is not much, it is very difficult to separate and recycle. So that is why the challenge here lies in the separation of the catalyst and product. Okay. So now the thing is 
use of solvents because if you are conducting it in the liquid phase, so you need a solvent. So, this use of solvent in the reactor necessitates an extra separation equipment. So, it means if you are doing in a CSTR, so this solvent whatever you are carrying out the reaction here, this solvent then needs to be recovered because recovered means recovered from the catalyst as well. So, it means some of the reactant products may be inside or some may be separate out in a different phase, maybe in liquid phase. So, it, it needs to be separated. So, it means you need extra equipment. That is what it is, it increases the cost of the process. Okay. So, let us go ahead. Now, this is again a point which is reiterated here. The temperature window is restricted. So, as I told you, the catalyst and then there is a solvent. Both have temperature restriction. The catalyst homogeneous catalysts are particularly decomposed at higher temperature. So, it is not robust to high temperature neither the solvent. So, this is one disadvantage temperature window. Then most of the ligands this M this ligands where the metal center is there, this is expensive. Precious metals are used. Let us say these are rhodium. So, many are examples I can give this metal, metal can be rhodium, platinum, then iridium, then cobalt. All these examples, these metals are highly costly, so they are expensive. So, it means that if you are still going with these metals, your catalyst productivity should be very high. You should produce large volumes of catalyst. So, that losses also if you produce catalyst, it should not that most of the catalyst just get washed away in the solvent phase or in the reaction medium. So, their losses should be also a minimum. So, it means you require a full metal and ligand recovery. So, you require a full metal and ligand recovery. So, it means contamination of the reactor and associate equipment by the catalyst is a further issue. So, means you conduct, conduct experiment, let us say you have a reactor here, you have the reaction here. So, you have one here the product let us say you have the feed here. So, uh, let us say you have this single medium. So, you have the product here, then you will also have certain gases coming out the byproducts, let us say off gases. It means this byproducts then will go ahead, you need do not cannot throw it off, it is to be further treated and this byproducts may also have some catalyst. So, it means if you have some gases or some other product which can be condensed, then again you will need to recover the catalyst and send back to it. So, it means it is getting contaminated or when you take out the actual feed, I mean the conversion of the feed is converted to product. When the product comes out, you need to switch it to let us say a light end column which will separate it based on the molecular weight or a distillation or separation train, there also catalyst may find its way. So, it means it can contaminate the recovery stage as well as the, the condensate stage both. So, you have to take care so that it does not contaminate or that is not, uh, no, it, it does not contaminate the reactor and the associate equipment. Associate equipment primarily implies the recovery stages or recovery process. So, now let us see some examples of homogeneous catalysis. So, we will see some bulk chemical production. So, bulk production production is one is the acidic acid production by methanol carbonylation. So, methanol is reacted with carbon monoxide to form acetic acid. So, these are the delta H heat of uh, enthalpy of the reaction. So, it is called carbonylation why because you have a carbonyl group getting attached to CH3OH. Okay. So, you are getting CO carbonyl group attached to it, that is why it is called carbonylation. Then hydroformylation, so hydroformylation means you are adding hydrogen as well as a formyl group like hydrogenation, only adding hydrogen. In hydroformylation means you are adding hydrogen plus a formyl group, these are also called as oxo reactions. So, for example, this is a famous example, the propene will react with the syn gas, so this is the syn gas to form butyldehyde and isobutyldehyde. 
okay so this butyldehyde uh, is uh, very useful because this is further used for making uh, you know this plasticizer this is very used for making further products such as plasticizer so it will give a combination of iso and normal butyldehyde so this is another reaction where hydroformylation oxo reaction means see here hydrogen and co both are getting added so co is getting added and you have hydrogen getting also getting added that's called hydroformylation so going ahead we take other examples also oligomerization oligomer you know na? so you have a single monomer you prepare certain numbers attached to it it becomes oligomer when there are number of those and uh, varying in chains with various compounds monomers present then they are polymer so polymer and oligomer they are used interchangeably so in this case the classic example is the production of the oligomer which is here it's uh, ethene ethene to the primarily primarily production of ethene to linear alpha olefins this is called the sharp process so is the s stands for shell shell olefin processes actually so is olefin is is olefin shell oligomerization processes i think this o is based on olefins not oligomerization but it refers to this oligomerization reaction so it is helps us to produce this linear alpha olefins it means the alpha position you will have the double bond the first initial part the starting chain you will have the double bond remaining is the same so it means the products like one hexene one butene one pentene or one hexene octene all these are alpha linear alpha olefins so these are very important because they can be co monomers for high density polyethylene or low density polyethylene now you can all you have seen in the previous slide it can be used in the oxo process for aldehydes let's say you want to produce higher aldehydes so then you will require this oligomers of ethene as a starting material and the most important application for this oligomerization is the detergents in detergents you require these as the starting materials so lab means linear alkylated benzene sulfonates so these are called the detergent when you use it uh, you know you use it in your how home this detergent is what it have a, a long hydrophobic tail huh, and a hydrophilic chain so that part the hydrophobic chain it may be based on the this linear alpha olefin okay so that's why this is a major application where the precursor are the oligomers of ethene then the two important other components which are precursors for the production of some polymers are dimethyl terephthalate and terephthalic acid dimethyl terephthalate is made from this compound so you have this methanol and oxygen coming and reacting so form dimethyl terephthalate or terephthalic acid you react and form this terephthalic acid so where is this used these compounds this terephthalic acid and dimethyl terephthalate these are precursors for the manufacture of polyethylene terephthalate the pet so pet bottle you have seen pet uh, no all the plastic bottles feeding bottles so pet has many use okay so you must be knowing the pet bottles cold drink bottles all these things or they can be also be used for the manufacture of poly trimethylene terephthalate ptt or poly butylene terephthalate so these both these dimethyl terephthalate and terephthalic acid are the monomers for the production of these polymers pet ptt pbt okay this you should remember so we come to the point where you have to compare several processes so these are the bulk chemicals in the first column the acetic acid oxo alcohols alkenes and then the two the polymer precursor dimethyl terephthalate and terephthalic acid we just discuss these chemicals so worldwide capacity i think this entire data is in this particular book so it is till 2000 i think 12 something like that 2012 so production is around 16792 and 50 million tons per annum so catalyst material you see nickel rhodium rhodium or iridium then cobalt all these are the so the temperature condition now you see what are the temperature conditions see the temperature is not that high it ranges between 350 to 500 i think nothing goes beyond 500 so as i told you if it goes beyond 500 catalysts are more prone for decomposition and uh, another interesting fact is that if you see the temperature is low but the pressure is high why is that it will help 
to create the stable catalyst system. So, the reason behind is the pressure is high means you keep the catalyst to be stable enough. So, it should not react itself. So, that is why the you see the pressures are pretty high except for diamethyl triphthalate. most of them pressures are around, um, around ranging between 50 to 100 bar. Okay. So, these are some of the various bulk chemicals which are manufactured in the use of homogeneous catalysis process. Now, these are capacity for the heterogeneous, we just use the homogeneous, now it is a heterogeneous. So, this is the methanol, ammonia, sulfuric acid, FCC, ethene oxide. So, capacity is pretty high, this 70, 205, 240, 650, 24. So, catalyst system you see copper, iron, vanadium, zeolite, Ag, silver. Temperature, see now you can go over with a very high temperature see 700, 600 Kelvin. So, it is able to bear such high temperature and the pressure is also low except for the fact that the ammonia and methanol due to certain conditions it requires them. But look at these, the, some of these the pressures are pretty low, the sulfuric acid, FCC and ethane oxide, the pressures are very pretty low as compared to others. Huh? So, the overall the pressure in the temperature and pressure conditions varies between the homogeneous and the heterogeneous catalysis. Now, let us come to the first manufacturing process that is for acetic acid. Now, acetic acid is predominantly used for synthesis of where it is used, it is used for the synthesis of vinyl acetate and acetic anhydride. It can be also be used as a solvent such as the purification of terephthalic acid. There are several feedstocks where acetic acid can be produced and the process choices related to it, it the synthesis can vary for any other bulk material. So, like any other bulk chemical, it can be also be processed and produced in several other methods. So, the non-food grade acetic acid because it can be used for making vinegar. So, those other than that, that is why I am writing here non-food. Non-food acetic acid is made by one or two homogeneous catalyst procedure. The conventional method of sugar fermentation, what you do? You ferment the sugar to ethanol, you ferment the sugar to ethanol and then oxidize it to acetic acid. This is a conventional method, ferment sugar to ethanol and ethanol to oxygenation becomes acetic acid. Industrial process for the production of synthetic acetic acid was commercial, I mean this is way back 1916. So, the con process is, we will discuss this process briefly on the liquid phase oxidation of acetaldehyde. Instead of conventional method, we will take a look at the liquid phase oxidation of acetaldehyde. In the next slide, we will see the reaction mechanism. So, this is the reaction mechanism. Now, this I n means initiator. So, here is the acid, it has the initiation stage, it has the propagation step, termination step and this is the overall reaction. What is the overall reaction? Let us see first, acetaldehyde is oxidized to acetic acid. So, initially what you do is, you have the acetic acid, sorry the acetaldehyde reacts with the initiator to form a radical with the hydrogen getting and attached to the initiator. This radical then reacts with oxygen to form another radical. This radical is having another oxygen attached to it. So, uh, it oxidation occurs. This again reacts with the another acetic acetaldehyde molecule to form peristatic acid, peristatic acid, peri, periacetic acid. So, this is another form of acetic acid. So, this is not stable this peristatic acid and the radical itself. So, this radical again can be getting used in this reaction, in the propagation reaction, in the propagation reaction. This particular acidic form is again reacted with another molecule of acetaldehyde to form acetic acid. Now, we need to, so what is this basically? So, uh, ultimately what you do is, this is the termination reaction. So, propagation is this reaction, the propagation and termination of any two radical. So, it means that this is the termination reaction means what the acetaldehyde then reacts with this acid to form acetic acid. So, the overall reaction is presented here. Okay. So, this is the way the acetaldehyde route through which acetic acid is produced, initiation step, propagation step and the termination step. Then there is some improvement, the Monsanto process came. The Monsanto process what they see? is that there is another method what they have proposed that is the direct liquid phase oxidation of naphtha. 
So, uh, because they said that this natural gas was available, why do not we use the natural gas itself, let us say butane, we use butane directly the these um, hydrocarbons, natural gas or hydrocarbons are available easily. So, you do oxidation to form acidic acid and water, this is they are produced. But this reactions, why it gained prominence? Because hydrocarbons were initially the primary route to acidic acid because of their inexpensive cost. Reaction process is similar, it is based on a radical mechanism, I will not define it here. But the problem with this particular reaction is 50 percent of the feed is converted into byproducts. What are the byproducts? So, as I told you is a homogeneous catalysis means there are some byproducts formed because of the similarity of the acidic structure, the formic acid, the higher acid and the aldehyde, many which have restricted markets. So, in addition the method necessitates a highly sophisticated purification stream which increases investment and operation cost. So, because of the byproducts and because of the purification train, this method, the Monsanto method has been just it is obsolete nowadays. Then there is another method which the researchers have proposed, proposed instead of oxidation, can we do a carbonylation? Yes, we can do. You use methanol and do a carbonylation of methanol to form directly acetic acid. But this carbonylation route was known long time. But the issue is there is a lack of commercialization. Why? Because there was no suitable construction materials that could contain the corrosive reaction mixture because it is acidic acid. So, it is a corrosive reaction mixture at high pressures. So, then uh, because of this, it was not in use, it was not adopted. Finally, BASF constructed the first commercial methanol carbonylation plant in 1963 using a cobalt and iodide combination of atlas system. Two years later, then Monsanto improved upon that process, they just the, the process earlier process was obsolete, the oxidation of acetaldehyde. So, they were successfully marketed a carbonization process that utilizes the highly novel active and selective rhodium based catalyst. So, they developed a rhodium based catalyst which could work at a much lower pressure. Okay? So, now you see this is a competition where you do a research when you find out that okay, this is fine, the cobalt and iodide is fine, can we do or can we work with some other catalyst? Yes, they can. So, that is why Monsanto came. So, BSF did something, Monsanto improved upon it. So, if you see most of this production, if you see the violet ones are through this carbonylation route. Most of the, it is because in after years 75, 85, 92, the violets, these peaks, these buildings are pretty high. So, it means primary route was carbonylation. But prior to that, the violets are slower while the orange are higher implies the acetaldehyde oxidation was the primary one. Okay. So, that is how see the as the technology changes, the industry also changes and they will try to adopt newer methods based on the economics and the pricing or the market demands. Now, what are the routes then finally for the acetic acid production, industrial routes? So, the research for novel catalyst still continues despite the success of the Monsanto process. Now, the success of the Monsanto process led to other uh, companies also do some further research. Then what they did, they imp tried to improve the rhodium based system. So, they thought that can we substitute rhodium with other metal because rhodium is very costly. It is almost 40 dollars or 50 dollars per gram, it's very costly because of the high cost of rhodium is a significant factor. Can we replace this rhodium with some other, is it possible? So, that is where the British Petroleum 1996 introduced and in 2000 it was commercialized. They used a iridium based, it is called the cativa method. This is a recent significant development for the manufacture of acetic acid. So, see so many companies are now involved, we have BSF, Monsanto and British Petroleum. So, these are all big giants, of, they are I mean within the top 10 list manufacture, chemical list manufacturing company. So, it means further then Monsanto said that okay fine, the BP have manufactured this catalyst, we should not be uh, behind. So, what they did, they further uh, did some research and they found that if they discovered that iridium is active in the carbonization of methanol, but is less active when compared to rhodium. So, what they said is that the promoters if 
such as ruthenium if it can be added so then it will be much more improvement in the production of cativa method. So, the cativa method then they used a different catalyst where they used a promoter such as ruthenium. So, it has significant advantages over the Monsanto approach. Okay. So, iridium instead of iridium they used the cativa method but added ruthenium to it. So, overall the both the Monsanto and the BP process. So, whether it is iridium or this ruthenium. So, what it is the common factor binding these two process where the pressure was much lower than BASF process resulting in less severe lower cost operating condition and higher acidic yield. So, that is why this method are now dominating the entire industry while the BASF has become obsolete. So, this is the comparison of processes for acidic acid projects and this production. I will just compare this here. So, these are the acetaldehyde oxidation and or the butane oxidation just now I discussed. So, yield percentage you see 93 percent and 40 percent temperatures, pressures in catalyst. In this acetaldehyde oxidation and the hydrocarbon oxidation catalyst are usually manganese which are the. So, this catalyst are in the form of acetate salts of metal. Then uh, everything get replaced by the methanol carbonylation. Then three companies took care of this first BSF they found out this cobalt and iodide based catalyst and here the feed the yield was around 90 percent methanol. So, this is the feed actually the feed was this. So, this is feed. So, methanol okay. and uh, in the Monsanto process this is the I mean uh, the production and this BP cativa is this is the production. So, it means the, uh, the temperature and pressure if you see the pressure it is higher the BASF if you compare BASF with Monsanto and BP these are pretty lower. So, they were as I told you they were able to get those catalysts working at a much lower pressure and at temperature. So, temperature is also manageable very less. So, it means the Monsanto used the rhodium and iodide based while the BP cativa used iridium and a ruthenium as a promoter. Okay. So, this was the actually the, the entire outcome of this acetic acid route the production route. So, what I will do in the next class I will discuss this BASF Monsanto and BP, BP cativa method separately and then uh, we will come to know where this process uh, combination how this primarily how this catalyst works how the reaction mechanism with this catalyst takes place for the production of this acetic acid. Thank you and so what you do is you go through this article hence it actually describes acetic acid synthesis by the carbonization of methanol. Okay. So, this is a book chapter I do not know which is available in uh, open or not. Then the another this process is actually it discussed the cativa process. The cativa I have written here it is trademark process for the manufacture of acetic acid. So, here they will discuss the iridium catalyst why the iridium catalyst is used and how it improves the productivity for the established industrial process for manufacture of acetic acid. Thank you. Mm -hmm.